I spoke to Frida at some length at some length this morning and got a little bit of her background. Frida was born in 1926 in what was then Czechoslovakia. Her world was changed in 1938 when Hungary invaded, forcing civil limitations on Jewish citizens. Then, in 1943, under Hitler's command, Hungary started transporting its Jewish residents to concentration camps. Frida and her family were given a one-hour notice to leave their lifetime home. They were loaded into the back of a truck and sent onward to a transport, ultimately ending up in Auschwitz. Frida is one of only three in her family of 14 who survived. Frida's here with us today to answer any questions you might have about her experiences. Anybody? Mary will um, take the questions. Any questions? Do I need it? Frida, one, one question. I, I had a question as I was watching the film and just wondered, was there something in the film about Sonia's experience or the film that you particularly could relate to as you were thinking about your own experiences? Well, everybody been through something. I cannot talk about her, about her story. I can only tell what I went through. In 1943, before Pesach, after Pesach, the Hungarians, no Germans were there, the Hungarians, Police came with a big truck and they said, we have an order from Germany that you have to come. You have one hour to get ready and come on the truck and we'll take you. And you don't need nothing to take with you because you will get everything where you're going. Yeah. So we had, we didn't have any bread to take along because matzah was finished and we did, didn't have time yet to bake the bread. So we didn't have any food to take with us, but we took some rags, whatever we had, clothes. So they took us to a school in another little city, and they searched us, the Hungarians. If we have a ring or a chain, the children, they took everything off from us, because they, you don't need it there, you'll get new stuff. All right, they took it away, they took it away. Then they took us to a, a ghetto, a lot of people from all the places came around and we were in the ghetto. The ghetto was filled up with thousands of people and it was cold winter and it was a factory where they made uh, bricks, a brick factory. So we, we, when we arrived, we didn't have a barrack, we set just a roof from from uh, straw, and the, we slept on the ground. But the ground was so cold, and we didn't have no blankets. And the snow and the rain was coming in the morning. We all got up, all the children, and everybody was very cold. So, what can you do? Nothing. You don't have no to cover. We were hungry, already in the ghetto. It was bad. We were. My mother was saying. Let's get, wherever they take us, let's get out of here because we can't take it. Some people were lucky who come earlier to the ghetto from the other places because they got like little uh, uh, roof. It was buildings and they got a little, in one room, 10, people, 10 families had a corner. But we didn't have a corner anymore because there was no room anymore, so we were under, in the, under the sheds. Anyway, we were there about, four weeks suffering. A train come, the train was the, the how, do you, how do you call the? The kettle car. The kettle car, yeah. Everybody has to go. In that, and they pushed us in, in one, in the train. We didn't even have time to sit down. We just were standing there, and the children was crying, and they put a big pail in the middle of the train, and we had to do, they didn't let us out from there. So anyway, we didn't have no water. We didn't have that. So the train went so slow because that time we didn't know why the train goes so slow. Where are we going? We didn't know where they're taking us. It, every station, it stopped and it stopped and it stopped and it stopped. From 
where I live, to <coughs> Auschwitz was maybe a day and a half. We went about eight days at the train, and everybody was crying. So let's get out of this train because we are dying. And anyway, everybody said, I don't care. Where they take us? We have to get out of here. Finally, we arrived. We arrived to Auschwitz. We didn't know what Auschwitz is. They, they tell us that they take us someplace where they put us to work and you get everything to eat. But we knew already it's not true. So in the train, my father stands up. He was a tall guy like Alan, like my son, and looks through the windows and sees big chimneys with fire. And I go over there, what are you looking there? Oh, look at this fire. I went through so, so many, the first world war, and I never saw such a big fire from the chimneys. So I said, I remember exactly. What do you, don't you, what, what do you think they burning the people? He says, I don't know. That was it. Well, finally came a, it was a Saturday, we were sitting in the train, we were sitting in the train. They didn't let us out because there were so many trains coming and so many people, the crematoriums couldn't take so far, so many people. So we were standing there for a day and a half and so my mother said, I don't care what they do with us, I have to get out. Finally, they, at night, middle of the night, they opened the train, our house, our house, our and we see people there with striped clothes, and they, we didn't know who they are, but it was Jewish people working. So we got out. All of a sudden, they threw a microphone. Man separate, woman separate. The, all the people that take the, your children and go separate, and the young people go separate. From, they even said from what age to what age. I don't remember. Anyway, all of a sudden, I don't know where they disappeared. I tell my story. I don't see my sisters, I don't see my father, I don't see nobody. So I come to, there was a light and three SS people standing, and they ask me, we are, we are this too. How old are you? So I tell them. So they touch me. So they threw me this way. I didn't see her, I don't see my mother, I don't see nobody. And finally I came between the younger people and I fit found my two sisters. And we were very happy. It was dark. It was uh, the SS was on top on those uh, I don't even know how to the Bachmach, the the, 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 the watchers. So and we go and Go. They say this way. We were about 500 from thousands of people, girls, only <coughs> girls, young girls. If you were old, you were not going there. There were some old people come in, but they got, they died anyway. So we were going. It was a terrible night when we arrived. We saw big fires from the ground, pits, and all of a sudden they thrown. And we saw, oh my God. They're throwing people, we said, we can close it. They're throwing people in the pits. And I had a lot of clothes on me because they didn't let the clothes. Leave the clothes, don't worry, you don't have to slap anything. You, you just leave everything because over there you're going to get. So I had a coat on and I said to myself, oh my God, at least I have a coat. I'm not going to feel the fire so fast. Anyway, so we came in a big building and we didn't want to get undressed. So we, they were screaming at us. There was Jewish girls who were the couples because they had to work. You have to get undressed and you're going to get a shower, you're going to get the clothes, and then you're going to be all right, you're going to go to a camp. So finally, we got undressed. Everybody's naked, stays in line. There are men cutting this hair, cutting, shaving us. We went in the shower, the big shower, and we were getting the showers. All right, finish the shower, come outside, no towels, huh? we get a striped dress and wooden shoes. So we walk, and we 
stay there. We are so tired from our home life and everything. All of a sudden, I see the man, and my sister says, oh, look, our father is there, and my brother was there. They never survived. They were also already in striped clothes, and my father says, oh my God, I can't recognize you from the bed. You look all the same. You look like little lambs, everybody in the same clothes, and there's no hair, no nothing. But then they took us away. We came to the camp in Auschwitz. Finally, they put us in this barracks, the uh, bomb beds. So we had to go on top, on the top, top floor. So nine girls were shipped. We were there sharing the bunk bed. So, but we are all hungry, so they come and they give, all right, they said, the girls downstairs, they said, soon you're going to get some soup. Don't worry, don't worry. So they got, get, we're waiting for the soup. So they bring up like this, no spoon, no nothing. You have to drink it and go in a row, and everybody get the drink. And we were watching, when is it going to come to me already? Maybe it's going to be empty. So. It was some kind of a grass with potato pill, that, but we ate it. Well, we were there in that, ca in that uh, few weeks. All of a sudden, we hear our names calling out. So we didn't know where, but we went downstairs in, from the, where we were sleeping. And a big, a lot of people, young people, going someplace and walking. Then we went to this barrack. They were giving us the numbers. We got no more names, number. So we had got the numbers, and I got a small number. There was a Greek girl, a Jewish girl. She says, I'll give you a small number. If you ever survive, at least you're not going to have a big. So she gave me a real small number. So of course, my, my older sister went, then my middle sister went, then I was on the end. Finished, we came already. <clears throat> back to the camp. We were there, I don't know how long, maybe two weeks. We were called out again. We were a commander, commander, going to work. So where did you go? Near the crematorium. There was a boat. So we walked about five miles from Auschwitz to Birkenau, where the crematorium was, and we were working there. Closed up. Nobody was able to go out. What did we do? All the luggage from the trains, from every, came to us in, in barracks. It was about 10 barracks or 20, I don't even remember. Fill, filled up with lumpum, lumpum is clothes, packages, valises. So we were assigned to one, so many girls in each barrack, about 20 girls. And they bring the, the clothes and the luggage, and we had to open everything. And they signed up. There goes this gold, there goes this money, there goes this linen. And we had to put everything nicely together. And they were packing it, and they were taking it. We didn't know where they take it, but to Germany. Well, we were in Auschwitz. Then we were there till January. In January, you know, the war was already coming close. The Russians were coming. They were saying, so we went. They, um, they closed up the Auschwitz that we were working. We went on the death march. It was very cold, it was January. And when we walked, it was snow, and we didn't have really good shoes and our clothes, but girls were freezing, falling down. The two Germans were, one side and the other side, and then another. They didn't even give a bullet to the girl. Leave her alone. She froze, died. And then <clears throat> finally, we walked, I don't know how long, but we slept in stables where hay was. We arrived open trains, they put us on the train, and they take us to a different camp further. And the, and the train was so cold, but I went under, and on top of me were a lot of girls, and in the morning I get up, 
All the girls are frozen on top of me. Nobody's moving. I crawled out. They threw out the order. The bodies we went to Ravensbrück. It's a different, but this is a different camp. Ravensbrück was terrible because there was no more a barracks where to go in. They made a like a circus from a tent, a big place, a big place. So it's good, I'm sure. Anyway, a big place, and we went in there, and it was like a circus, and we had bunk beds there, but there was no showers, there was nothing, and the snow was melting, and it came under the, under the, in the water, the water came to the, the water came underneath, and when we went down from the, from the bunk bed, we went in the water, it was so cold, and then we were called out a commander, we're going to work. All right, you stand, stand. Every morning they chased you out for a pal. A pal means they counted the girls every morning. Nobody can run away any place because the are you going to run? There's wires, we were wired up. So they took us to work. It was a big snow. Do you mind if I give a drink water on the right already? I'm not going to take too long. I just must tell my story a little bit. So we went to work. Who, we were about 100 girls. So we were marching. We have to sing when we march. They, we were singing. I still remember the, the song. Schuhe's Strümpfe zu zurissen, Haar abgeschnitten. It means the shoes and the clothes is all torn up, <coughs> no hair. But we have, yes, your wall, yes, your wall, like something like that. So we go to work. We thought maybe we think we're going to a factory. We didn't know where we're going. We come to a forest. And the forest was big snow. And we had to take this two girls, girl there, a saw by hand, cutting down the trees. We're cutting down the trees and cutting them in pieces and then putting together. And then trucks came and took the wood. I don't know where they taken for the people, for the Germans to heat the houses or what. So we were there, but I don't even remember what two or three months. From there was a terrible, no food. There was so many people. When we came, we have to stay in line for the coffee, black coffee, a little piece of bread. Till we came, there was no coffee, there was no bread. Oh, we had to go in without, because it was finished. They didn't have enough food. So we went to another camp. We came to Malchow. Malchow was no crematoriums, but we had to work there too. So my sisters wanted, we, first they put us underground. We were making bullets on a machine, made bullets. After that, it was finished, the bullets were finished. They sent us something. Everybody had assigned to a different job. So I was, my sister, the, my older sister got a job. They were cleaning the, the lotteries, you know, the, the, the toilets. And they were taking the dirt, some on the fields, and she had a bit of truck. The truck pop, pop, took out the dirt from the toilets. You know, it was, it was a terrible thing. And they took it to a field. And my sister, with the truck, had a big pipe, and she had to hold the pipe and go in like this. Oh, the dirt was coming out. Anyway, and my other sister was working some, also in the factory, making the bullets, so she was still there, and they took me out. So then it was a, also bed on the floor. The dirt, you didn't have the facilities to wash yourself, you didn't have, you slept on straw, 
it was very dirty. You had lice, you had all kinds, no food. We never thought that we would survive. Once my sister got, and it was in Auschwitz, she did something, I don't remember, but she got 25 on her, on her back with a, with a strap from the SS. She was sick for two weeks, all blown up, but I, I thought she'll never make it, but she made it. Julie was her name, great lady. Anyway, after that, they assigned me with another girl, young girl from Romania. We're going to work on a revere. A revere is a little hospital, but that hospital was already also bomb beds. They were dying, the people were dying already. So they put them on there. There was no doctors. So we had to <coughs> give the food to them, but they couldn't eat anymore because they were all they were all like Muslim and they didn't drink. So we survived, we drink their their soup. But they brought it in a garbage can, the soup. And they give we had to give it out for the sick people. But some drink, some couldn't drink anymore. And when somebody died, we had a blanket. We had to take him down from the bunk bed, put him in the blanket, and the girl and I was pulling it and put it on the lot of oh, people who were together. The dead people, we throw them there and come back with the blanket and all the, obviously to the people there. It was terrible, but we never figured we would survive anyway. So whatever, we, you know how it is? You always hope that there is a tomorrow. People are like, maybe tomorrow will be better, but it was never better. All of a sudden, it was like the war is over. They let us on the street. And we see American soldiers coming in, in the, in the jeep, jeeps, you know, in those open cars. They throw us cigarettes. Cigarettes. We need cigarettes. We need cigarettes. Didn't know what to do with the cigarettes. We were hungry. And then the American soldiers left. The Russians came in. I was liberated. Our people, but, but the Russians. The Russians were so stupid. They, they almost killed us too. They, they wanted the girls. The girls were sick girls. So, and they were drunk, so we ran away in, a, in some kind of far away. And they were so drunk they couldn't move. They, we left them there on the ground to slow <laughs> And then we said, we're not going back to this little house. We were, we were about 30 people left, survivors from all over, from Romania, from Poland, from everywhere. And some boys were there, some girls and we were in that little house. But we said, we're not going back to the house because those Russians will come in at night and they will grab the girls. So we went look in a stable and we hide in, were hiding in the stable where the cows are eating under, under the hay. And they came to look for us, but they didn't find us because we were under the hay. In the morning, Early in the morning, we get up and we see, we're going to go to the house and take our stuff because we had a few bundles already, but we organized from other, from the Germans left over because the Germans ran away. The German houses were empty. So we took this little house, it was empty, and we said, let's pack up and we get away because the Russians will kill us. We were about maybe, a half a kilometer away from the house, all of a sudden we see our house is burning. The Russians threw the granites and grenades in the, in the house and it started, we would be all dead. So we survived again. And then we were sitting someplace and a Russian soldier came and he asked us who he talked to us in Russian, but I know Russian too, so 
ka koi na nazina antrat ka what are you so we didn't want to say we are jews because we were we were afraid from the polish people or whatever so he says all right you're very smart i know you are jewish i'm a jewish man too i'm a jewish russian soldier he brought us food salami and some little bread and we ate all of us got so sick <laughs> because we were not used to that the, the, and when you walked you just excuse me it was just coming from you we were very sick but then the, the, the Jewish fellow took us with the truck near a, near a train but the trains didn't go because everything was bumped no trains we didn't even know where we were going finally a train came so we went on this train I didn't know where we didn't know where we were going a lot of we were all together a whole group of us and then we were, the train stopped for a couple days there in Poland or where so a guy said to us why are you on the train the train goes to Sibir you're going to be killed there we didn't go anymore on the train. <laughs> so anyway, we went back, and then we were in Prague. And in Prague, the Haganah from Israel came and was talking to us. You come back to this, uh, Germany, and from Germany, you're going to come to Palestine, to Israel. So well, listen, we don't have to, we don't have where to go, so we go. We came back to the camps, DP camps. DP camp is uh, displaced people, yeah. So we were there for four years, from 45 to 49. A lot of people went to Holland, a lot of people went to Australia, Canada, and some people got married there, they had children. So it was, a, it was the soldiers were living there, the American soldiers. And then, we, a lot of people went to America, and we were already going to Palestine. We were already on the trucks, going to go to the ship or whatever. All of a sudden, they off you go. The Exodus was called, they don't let them to Palestine, they went to Cyprus. So he didn't go anymore, he stayed in, in the camp. And then, I'll tell you how I come to America, because we didn't have any sponsors. Only people came to America if they had papers to be sponsored. But people who didn't have relatives, nobody sent the papers, he was there till, for years in the camps. In the camp, in the, 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 the displaced people again it wasn't a house it was paper bumpers paper towel paper balls we were there and finally when Truman became president <coughs> he said all the people the survivors they have to register if they going to come to America without any papers and that's how in 1948, we registered, we waited, and end of 1949, in December, we arrived to America. And that's how it is. I know you all want to go home, so I guess, I said, there's a lot of talk. I can talk and talk for hours, but I don't want to keep you back. I just did highlights, I told you. So from 14 people in the immediate family, three of us left, two already died, I'm by myself. And my sisters and I, we figured out all the aunts and the nieces and the nephews, about 80 people were burned, destroyed. I, but every day, every night, I don't go to sleep till I don't pray for everybody. This is, but I'm relieved by everybody's name. 
I say they should rest in peace. And people, my aunt, my uncle, they, nobody came home. Who's praying for them? I pray for them. And that keeps me alive. I, the prayers. I cry where nobody sees. Yeah. I don't cry between people. And this is what it, this is how I survive. And I have two beautiful songs. And they're very good boys. And they love their mother and they love them. Okay, get up. Stand up. Her family. Frida, we're so grateful for your presence, you. your story, and, and we're so grateful that you are with us and that you are keeping the memory of your family alive, even after their departures. Five grandchildren. Five grandchildren and three son, two sons, and so grateful to have all of you here. Thank you.